Welcome to Thinking Like a Lawyer with your hosts, Ellie Mistal and Joe Patrice, talking about legal news and pop culture, all while thinking like a lawyer, here on Legal Talk Network. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Thinking Like a Lawyer. Yes, yes. (laughs) <laughs> yes, eat it up, audience. <laughs> I'm Joe Patrice from Above the Law. I'm not joined by Ellie Mistal, as I usually am, because he is traveling, winging it out into the heartland for a business trip. So would I be able to come on this show and do it all by myself? Obviously not, because nobody wants to listen to me talk by myself. So Catherine Rubino, who's also here at Above the Law, our guest from Last episode, actually. Hey. Yeah. Is, I'm still here, so yeah, you're still might here. as well just use, use yeah. me right here. Well, and you're familiar. You know everyone's name. So, so that, that helps. Yeah. You know. yeah. I mean, our standards are... Pretty low. Yeah. I, I mean, mean I, I work here. So. I, oh. oh. oh yeah. Self-depreciating is so a little bit better. Self-deprecating, Deprecating. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, Depreciating? Like, I, I depreciating don't, value. I don't know. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah. It's, uh, um, yeah. That, that joke was... Uh, Poor? Yeah. Yeah. Depreciating over time. Well, <laughs> yeah, we're still having fun with the uh, sound with the soundboards here. So yeah, so since we're not you know rage filled people, I thought we would talk about instead of a grinding of gears, we could do the like I don't know daily up to the minute explosive coverage of above the law of the week. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, I mean. Like the rest of the world, the legal news has pretty much been all sexual harassment and assault all the time, which is depressing, actually. But yeah. at least we're talking about it at long last. Yeah, I mean, it's true. Like, I, you know, you kind of feel bad because every day one of these things happens as writers covering it, we're like, it's good to have work, uh, <laughs> but it's uh, awful it's that this has to be the work that it is. For sure. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the the big thing, at least from my perspective, has been... Roy Moore. Actually, pretty much everything has flowed from a Roy Moore issue. We got uh, former Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court. He's trying to and will inevitably become the next senator from Alabama Ugh. because Alabama. But he brought himself a lawyer, Trent Garman, who is from a unaccredited law school. Which hey, there's there's Somebody, no- you yeah, know. there's nothing wrong with that, other yeah. than you know that they aren't accredited for a reason because they're actually terrible law schools. But otherwise, (laughs) there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, And he's representing the chief justice or former chief justice. And it's been... Well, listen, he needs work, right? Yeah, I mean, I I guess the word disaster comes to mind. Mm. Uh, Mm. So he wrote this demand letter of the local newspaper to tell them to stop printing things that, you know... Or true. You know, we don't know. These allegations that seem Mm, to be... Certainly newsworthy. ...excessively sourced and are certainly newsworthy. And it's... You should go on Above the Law and we have the letter up. It's fairly embarrassing. Uh, Typos are not really great for a lawyer. It's it's typos. It's grammatical mistakes. It's not understanding basic stuff about the English language. I mean, there's words in there where I'm like, I don't even know what he's asking at this point. I mean, the... Quip I make is uh, I know fourteen year olds who write better than that, Aww. and I'm pretty sure Roy Moore does too. Ooh. Ooh. Oh no, that's that's a bad one for that. People should have thought that was funny. <laughs> yeah, all right, yeah. Our, our audience, we're in New York. People think that's funny <laughs> up here. So anyway, so that's been that's been the big thing that we've been talking about. And then Ellie had a follow up because Mr. Garman decided to go on TV and. Wow, make something of a jackhole of himself. Yeah, it got a little uh, racist there, didn't it? It got racist fast. Pretty quick. Yeah, pretty quick, like actually. real fast. He, well, the, the one that got me is even though, even though Ellie's focused on something that he did a day or so ago where he said of a MSNBC host who is, you know, non, non-white. Of, no, a non-white, a, a non-white host that you know he would understand how pedophilia works because of different cultures oh, prompting somebody to jump in and point out he's from Canada <laughs> oh. um which i mean let's face it i think he was probably making a point that you know Canada mm. yeah i mean we all know what goes on in Saskatchewan <laughs> no uh but wow I, yeah i don't wow. know <laughs> i don't, like it, i 
so anyway, the the point is he did that. But I actually thought the better one was he was on Don Lemon and decided to keep calling him Lemon Squeezy the whole time. Yikes. That's just, did you not see this one? I'd heard about it, but I haven't actually seen the clip. It's, it's cringeworthy. Yeah. I don't like to watch things that are cringeworthy. I'm not a really? big... I'm not a big, like, Curb Your Enthusiasm fan for that reason. I'm like, oh, gosh, like, life is cringeworthy enough. I don't need that to be, like, my fun time. Wow. You find life cringeworthy? Oh, my you, gosh. Do you, you yes. need a hug? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much all the time. Yeah. All right. Well, But and then, you know, people, um, a big law attorney, uh, Mercedes Coleman um, from Gordon and Reese, went on Fox News to defend some of the allegations against uh, Roy Moore. And uh, in her defense said that the majority of sexual harassment victims who came forward were really just in it for the money. And oh. true victims were few and far between. Really? Yeah. The, her firm was not pleased. No. no. Uh, it, it, her firm wasn't. Well, you know, it's interesting. She thought they were few and far between, but did clarify saying that, you know, she and her family had been victims. Sure. But, you know, sure. Like, but, you know the people who... Otherwise. Otherwise, everyone else is just a bunch of liars. Uh, she had some clarifying comments, but did not walk back the few and far between language and uh, i wonder what her firm would think about that poorly they think poorly of those <laughs> comments and she's voluntarily left management of the firm because not only was she just a partner at a big law firm which is a pretty high profile and high responsibility job she was actually managing partner for the new york office she's no longer the managing yeah, partner of the new york office <laughs> yeah wow yeah so those are big things going on at above the law it's you know a little unfortunate that they're all... But at least we're talking about it, opening up the conversation. Yeah, good for us. Well, I, I mean, like, yeah, society at large, but okay. That was more just so I could force in another sound effect. Oh. Yeah, yeah. no. Push a random one right about now. There you go. <gasps> and today, we're going to talk with Jeff Tun from Blue Lock, and the reason we brought Jeff on is that Blue Lock has a publication out about some new predictions for where the industry is going to go in the next year. And we wanted to kind of get a hold of where we are going to go next year and talk about that. So welcome, Jeff, to the show. Thank you very much, Joe and Catherine. Thank you so much for having me as a guest on the show. Looking forward to our discussion. Yeah, absolutely. And this, I guess before we go too far, I guess we should talk about what you do at Blue Lock and what Blue Lock is for listeners who aren't maybe aren't familiar. Absolutely. Blue Lock is a cloud services provider. We've been around for about 11 years, and we have a cloud that has two primary regions, an east region and a west region here in the U.S., uh, and multiple zones. So if you're familiar with cloud computing, we're one of the providers of those solutions. About five years ago, we started specializing in disaster recovery as a service, so the concept uh, of technology as a service and having our cloud be the target for companies' disaster recovery efforts. And we've been specializing the last uh, several years in the legal vertical because we really felt like the legal vertical was really ready to begin cloud adoption, was looking for solutions to lessen their capital expense and maybe move more to an OPEX model. And it really fit with what we can provide and the solution that we bring to our clients. Myself, I'm the executive vice president for product and service development here at Blue Lock, which means I get the fun job of looking a year, two years, three years, four years down the road and looking for what problems companies may be facing, what law firms may be facing, and the technology advances that we can marry up and provide solutions. So it's kind of that forward-looking role that's uh, that's really exciting. Well, and that seems to be, uh, that's probably a good reason to have this kind of predictions piece. Uh, so with this predictions piece, where did the idea originate to start coming up with a list of predictions and how do you go about gathering insights, who do you contact to really flesh this out? So as we were talking with some of our clients and some of our prospects, uh, we know that, that law firms uh, in particular like to know what other firms are doing. They don't want to be the last one to adopt, but they don't want to be the first one either. And so we wanted to be able to give the legal IT folks a leg up on what's coming at them so that they can stay on top of the conversation when they're meeting after work for a beer or a bourbon with their peers 
Uh, it's really <laughs> important that we include other contributors in this process as well. So we reached out to uh, many of our clients. We reached out to many industry analysts that work in legal tech. We asked them for input as well because our expertise is in disaster recovery as a service and secure cloud hosting. We wanted to get a broader uh, exposure to some of the advances in legal technology. Yeah, you know, I, the idea of the legal industry, they really are just the most milk toast people on the playground, right? Like they, <laughs> they don't want to start it. They don't want to be last. They're just kind of hoping to get through their day without risk getting, adverse. Yeah. In the worst way of that yeah. phrase. No, it's, it's so true. Well, so I guess maybe it, it's a good thing. Not that, not that we're saying that's what we're doing here, but like maybe it, for the, for all of us, uh, industry analysts and in, in all ways that our role is a good natured peer pressure to, uh, <laughs> to let people know, no, 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 no. This is what you need to do. Trust me. All the cool kids are doing it. <laughs> this is really exactly. a problem. <laughs> The cloud is totally cool. If you aren't on the cloud, I mean, just really Don't be scared. Really, what are you? Yeah. So, um, I guess it was. Let's segue to like Blue Lock's real expertise here. This disaster recovery idea, because I think it's you and I talked a little bit about this a few months ago when we met. Uh, but it's it's a thing that a lot of law firms probably aren't thinking about uh, how important it is to have disaster recovery. But it's a real crucial response for a variety of reasons, be it cybersecurity or real like natural, natural disasters, disasters or whatever. Yeah, it, it is something that we found that, uh, you know, it's seen typically when you talk about disaster recovery, it's seen as an insurance policy, almost against solely natural disasters. And in fact, we were talking with a prospect uh, earlier uh, this week, and they were like, well, you know, we've been in business for 16 years. And we had that ice storm that one time, but we didn't even really lose power to our office. So not really sure that, that uh, we need disaster recovery. And what's really started to happen is it's become more uh, than just natural disasters. In fact, the occurrence of a natural disaster that causes an IT disaster recovery process is really quite small. What you see more often is human error, something gets changed that wasn't intended to be changed, or uh, an entire database gets to deleted. Uh, and then most recently, the headline grabbers are the ransomware attacks that are yeah. more and more being targeted at law firms uh, because the hackers are getting smart and they realize, gosh, we may not be able to penetrate the banks or we may not be able to penetrate the, the uh, healthcare providers, but man, the attorneys have all the data, so let's go after the attorneys and let's try to get the data or at least hold the data ransom from there. So you've started to see more and more of the headlines around that. Disaster recovery as a service specifically is a great restorative technique for mitigating some of the risk against ransomware. You're able to recover much faster. You don't have to pay the ransom or run the risk that you can't even uh, recover after the ransom anyway. So you've got clean copies of your data at your cloud provider, and that gives you another uh, avenue to protect your data more on the restorative side. So we started talking about disaster recovery really in the terms of data protection. And so you look at data protection and you've got the preventative on one side that everybody's fairly familiar with uh, from a technology perspective. It's the firewalls, it's encryption, it's things like that. But on the opposite side of that coin, you've got restorative because, man, you can spend a lot of money on preventative and they're still going to get in. You're one click away from someone clicking on the wrong email, clicking on the wrong website, and all of a sudden, all your data is gone or, or at least encrypted. So you've got preventative on one side, but you not you have to be able to recover once that happens. And then you've also got to have that bridge in the middle of detection, being able to understand when you've been hit by some sort of cyber attack uh, or some sort of event so that you know that you can then move into response and recovery mode. Jeff, you mentioned that the legal industry is more vulnerable than some other industries, such as the finance and healthcare, I think you mentioned. Do you have any insight as to why that is? Why is legal lagging behind the other industries? Well, I, I think part of it 
is because they typically run with a very small IT shop. So they're running very lean and therefore they don't have all the resources available to continue to do active log monitoring and watching for the threats as they come at them. Uh, And then the other part of it is they're relying on technology for the restorative side that's, that's pretty old. They're relying on tape backups predominantly for being able to have copies of their data. And so they may not even have the ability to recover because those tapes may be old, they may be unreadable, they need another data center where they can recover the information too. So it's just that there are a lot of companies, but law firms in particular, uh, have not kept up with some of the most recent advances in those types of technologies. And the hackers are, are always looking for the weak link, right? They're always trying to find where in the supply chain uh, they can get in. You, you look at the famous Target hack several years ago. It was a guy that worked for a heating and cooling vendor whose credentials were compromised, and that was the way they got in and got to all their point of sale information. So they're looking for any way, and so they're working through the supply chain, they're looking through the vendors, and they're finding that the law firms are a weak link. I mean, we always kind of joke that lawyers tend to be Luddites and slow and conservative when it comes to technology, but it it seems like this is moving beyond the joke and coming a real issue for the industry. Yeah, I think that it is. And what's happening uh, to a lot of firms is they're getting pressure from their clients to really pay attention to their technology, their compliance. Uh, so, you know, we've had uh, instances where we've, we've talked to firms and, and it's like we were talking to them about the cost of the downtime, right? And they're saying, well, you know, gosh, that's really never been something that got us interested in spending money to try to mitigate that risk. What really got us to move was our largest client came to us and said, thou shalt do DR and thou shalt prove it yeah. and thou shalt do it by September. Uh, and that's really what got them going was all of a sudden, you know, they see the, the clients bringing that to them and saying, we need you to protect our data like we would protect our data. Yeah. I think there's also probably a risk that lawyers could find themselves guilty of malpractice, too, if they're not coming up to the industry standards in a lot of these areas. Oh, industry standards, like we have those. <laughs> yeah, I think there's uh, there's there's a case that's uh, going on in the Chicago area right now. I don't have the the exact case, but there's lawsuits in progress that they're trying to hold the law firm accountable for data loss. Yeah, I think that's Shore versus Johnson and Bell. Oh, look at Ooh. yeah, yeah. In fact, I think I it's in the something. ebook actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so we've talked a little bit. About about this, and it's kind of led into a discussion of cybersecurity. So looking through the predictions, one thing that struck out to me was of all the cybersecurity risks, the panoply of cybersecurity risks out there, a lot of the experts that you talked to really felt ransomware was where the direction that the attacks are going to start going. Yeah, that's, that's what we've seen. It's just, it's growing exponentially, and it's almost become more than just trying to hold someone ransom. You have the recent case that caught up DLA Piper. My understanding of of that particular attack was the cyber criminals were really trying to disrupt the entire economy of the Ukraine, and DLA Piper just happened to be caught up in all of that. So it's becoming even more nefarious than just the ransomware itself. It's becoming destructive uh, and disruptive. Yeah, the whole idea of ransomware, what's interesting about it is it's kind of the the blessing and curse. Like at a certain point, attacking somebody and demanding ransom exposes you to, you know, people being able to find you. But I mean, I guess with (laughs) cryptocurrencies and so on these days, you might be able to get away with it. Yeah, it makes it a lot harder, uh, definitely, to find the source of the attack and who's gaining from the ransomware you start getting into uh, Bitcoin and uh, blockchain technology, uh, it makes it uh, pretty difficult to track down who the end perpetrator was. Yeah. 
But I guess this is a good place to kind of pivot the discussion to blockchain technology because we're now talking about all the risks to the extent that it makes ransomware an option and so on and so forth. But there's there's also some predictions in the piece about blockchain and the you know the advantages that it could have for legal practices. So I guess maybe the first thing is if we can go through like what is blockchain for people who just have heard those words and don't know what it is, but then also like what are your folks saying might be the applications and the future of it within the legal industry? Absolutely. So so blockchain is a distributed ledger system at its most basic. So think about today when you have a financial transaction, you have your accounting system, Catherine has her accounting system, and I have my accounting system. And they could all say different things. Um, under a blockchain, we've entered into some sort of agreement that we're going to all share a single source of truth, the blockchain. And so when a transaction occurs, all three of us get a copy of it, and we validate that it is the correct copy. In other words, because of the way the blockchain works, every block that gets written is linked to or chained to the previous block. And there's a, there's a hash associated with the content so that the computer systems that are processing these transactions know that this block is connected to that block and it knows that previous block didn't change because the hashes are the same. And so basically what that means then is we all have a single version of the truth and we can all verify that transaction much more securely and much quicker. And the first real big implementation of blockchain was Bitcoin, which uh, is has gotten uh, kind of a negative association with it because that's typically what the ransomware attackers are <laughs> uh, wanting you to pay with is Bitcoin. Uh, and so your first step uh, when you get hit by ransomware is what the hell is Bitcoin and where do I get one, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but blockchain really goes far beyond that. And that's where I think the real interesting part of it is because it really, there's there's no industry that at some point won't be disrupted by blockchain technology. So for uh, for an attorney, for a law practice, there's really two sides to the blockchain coin. One is your clients are going to be impacted by it. And so you need to really understand what it is and how it can impact their business so you can consult with them and be that trusted advisor in, first of all, how do you set it up? How do you manage it? How do you process it? But then there's also going to be impacts on law firms themselves in how things get processed. The whole concept of uh, called a smart contract. So because of the way the blockchain works, you can actually embed code in a transaction. And so the code can execute based on transactions that come in. So at its uh, simplest form, think of the contract between a buyer and a seller, the implied contract that, hey, if I give you money, you're going to ship me product. Well, you have to wait until my money has cleared through whatever clearing mechanism you use, whether I'm using my credit card or whatever, before you want to ship me the product because you want to make sure that you're paid for it. And I want to make sure you're going to ship me the product if I pay you the money. So we've, we've got that element of almost mistrust in that transaction. But what if it was using blockchain technology and the minute that the financial value transferred, it sends a signal to my shipping system or your shipping system to send me the product. So it automates that part of it. And you can begin to see where you can build smarter and smarter contracts between companies, between companies and individuals that will execute code or execute the terms of the contract based on what an external event might be. Uh, think of uh, vacation travel and vacation uh, insurance, right? Okay. You've got to, you buy that insurance in case your, uh, your cruise ship has to stay in port and you can't go on your cruise. Well, 
Oh, that's nicer There's than technology a that knows <laughs> that, right? So you you pay that that fee, and the minute that that cruise ship doesn't leave, the blockchain can execute that smart contract and pay the recipient or the insured. So it's got lots of different uh, applications to it. Yeah, I've heard I've heard some people talk about these smart contracts that we're old litigators here. So, you know, this is, above, this is above our head. But <laughs> from the transactional people I've heard, a lot of what happens is you get these complex banking agreements where it's like, if LIBOR hits this, then you get this. If it goes back down to this, then this. And they're doing hundreds of transactions between these institutions based on fluctuating things in the market. And you can set this up to make sure that the money's going instantaneously as opposed to having actual people. <laughs> well, the way it used to work Absolutely. is basically somebody's job was at the end of the quarter to count up how many times it'd gone back and forth and figure Plus, out minus. the <laughs> lump sum. And, and now you can just actually ship this stuff all the time, uh, which is kind of cool. Exactly. So I guess the final topic to talk about, which I, I, we've got to, because I think in the field of legal technology, there's a law that requires like a five-year penalty if you don't discuss AI or machine <laughs> learning in any legal tech conversation. Uh, but well, it, I mean, I think part of it's that it's so poorly understood by the majority of lawyers. They are aware that it exists because, you know, they have seen dystopian movies before. Otherwise, they're not really sure how it will wind up applying to the legal industry. Yeah, I mean, I guess... They, I, I just am doing it because when the robot takeover happens, they will hear this podcast and know that I was already <laughs> on, on their, their side. side. You were on their side all along. And, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I will be helpful in the salt mines. That, <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, so I guess we should talk about what's on the horizon in the AI-ish world. Uh, there were some predictions about that uh, in the piece. And so what's up for 2018 in machine learning and AI? Well, I, I think, first of all, you know, AI and machine learning kind of get blended together. AI is, uh, uh, I kind of see it as the programmatic implementation of intelligence, right? But then machine learning is the ability to feed data to a compute device and it learns or it, uh, it begins to look, see different insights in there. And, and so I think where I really see that starting within the legal profession and then growing are things like e-discovery, where you have to churn through so much data, looking for correlations, looking for things that are related, throwing out the things that aren't related. And so bringing AI and machine learning into that will really speed up the process and I think it would also, over time, increase the accuracy of doing that. So if you start there in the e-discovery world, then you can start thinking about, well, what about case law and the researching of the volumes and volumes of case law? Can you apply machine learning to that? And pretty soon, if I'm a, if I'm a paralegal in a law firm, I'm starting to get nervous. Uh, because <laughs> a lot of the a lot of the work that I do now is being automated through AI and machine learning, so you can begin to see how it grows. And what you really end up with is the the attorney providing that that top layer of intelligence in interpreting what the machine has gone through and understood and reported back, and then providing counsel to the clients which is really what you want the attorney doing anyway, not all that research and research and research. Yeah, one of the um, mantras that I've heard before at a tech show of somebody, and this was about tech generally, but AI being one of it, is that it its job is never to replace, it's never to write a Beethoven's symphony, but it could have given him time to write another one. I heard that one once. Yeah. I was like, that's kind of oh, funny. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. The real thing is not like it's going to do the job of the lawyer, but it might get rid of enough of the garbage work that lawyers do that they can Well, unfortunately, a lot of that garbage work is employing quite a, quite a few lawyers. <laughs> well, and, and not just employing. I, I The thing that I speak about when I get in these sorts of conversations is, yeah, there, there's the employment level, which is important, but there's also a training level. Like, to some extent, these genius lawyers and partners at the top learned how to get there by 
spending time making mistakes, drudging through the awful work that we all kind of yeah. presented. And at a point where they stop being able to do that, like, how do they learn? That? I mean, there's definitely a skill, especially in litigation, of going through the documents and figuring yeah. out why certain docs are hot and why they're important and, and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. now machines are doing that, or theoretically machines could do that. And, you know, it's a skill definitely that people aren't going to be learning. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the argument that you hear sometimes about Google. We have students in school that no longer need to really learn because all they have to do is Google the answer. Um, yeah. And uh, so I, I think that is a challenge. And and one of the things about uh, technology that, that can be so interesting is there is a good side and there is a downside, right? And so you have to understand where that line is. And I think, uh, honestly, that's where some of the law firms can help us understand. You start getting into the implications of somebody programmed that computer. So what if the computer has a bias because somebody programmed it to have a bias, whether intentionally or unintentionally? You start looking at blockchain. We were talking earlier about blockchain and smart contracts. You know, I can see the lawyer of the future working side by side with a software developer because you need the software developer to help you write the contract. You bring to the table the legal knowledge and the context, and the developer brings the knowledge of the software and how to write that into a blockchain code. So I I think it all starts to come together. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jeff, for joining us and talking about what's new in the legal industry over this next year. It's uh, the piece is uh, 2018 predictions that Blue Lock has put out. Uh, we're going to have a little post about it. I think you're all putting up a post probably this today, I think, from what I hear. Yeah, uh, yes, we'll, yes, yes. We'll put something up about it too. Great. So thank you so much for going through this. Uh, thank all the listeners for listening. Thanks, Catherine, for filling in. Thanks, To everyone who's subscribing, importantly, if you aren't subscribing, do subscribe. Once you're subscribing, give us reviews, not just even the stars, which should be five, but also write something because it just helps all those algorithms think, hey, people are engaged and interested in it. So it moves us up the search rankings when people are looking for legal podcasts that are fun and entertaining. Those are actually the same word twice, but whatever. Point is, uh, do all those things. Follow us on Twitter. I'm at Joseph Patrice. She's at Catherine One. Read Above the Law. Get the LTN app. I think that's everything. Have a good day. Yeah. Thanks. All right, everybody. Talk to you later. Bye. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. You can also find us at AboveTheLaw.com, ATLRedline.com, iTunes, RSS, Twitter, and Facebook. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.